Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheila Cook with 3LM, and I want to welcome all of you to this webinar with Clive Bright, who has been managing holistically for a couple of years now. And he's going to share what he's been learning, but especially about this successful grazing through seasonal transitions. I think you are all aware that when we make those transitions from winter into spring and from summer into autumn, it can be especially tricky, you know, balancing the stock with the grass and these kind of things. And that's what Clive is going to speak with us about. The structure of our session tonight will begin with Clive um, speaking, and um, there will be time for Q&A at the end. And um, so save your Q&A. In fact, if you'd like to, you, as the Q questions come along, you could type them into chat so you don't have to remember it. And then I will, I will ask questions for as long as we have questions. Um, so I want to turn it over to Clive. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit blurry here, but uh, I have to put up with my... Um, uh, early 90s camera. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to talk through um, a couple of things really, but uh, we'll conclude with, with the title, um, Successful Grazing Through Seasonal Transitions. And um, so I'd, I'd like to thank Sheila, first of all, for inviting me to do this. And um, uh, yeah, so we'll move along. Oh, hold on. And my slides decided not to move. It's some really beautiful grass in that picture, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's cool. That's last summer. Oh, there we go. So just by way of introduction, um, my name is Clive Bright, obviously, and uh, I um, kind of farm and company name is Rare Room and Air. And we have a suckler to beef operation. We're 100% grass fed. Um, we're organic trust certified. And our main kind of management um, uh, tools, I suppose, are holistic plant grazing, uh, real interest in um, silvopasture and how that can advance things on the farm in our own context. And um, uh, we direct sell pretty much everything that we produce on the farm through beef boxes and we produce rose veal as well from animals we don't think are fit uh, for finished beef. Um, and part of uh, holistic management is to kind of have a, an overall an overall arching kind of statement of purpose. And this is my one, it's to leisurely, profitably and perpetually farm an aesthetic landscape to produce the highest quality meat. And the key words there are leisurely, profitable <laughs> and uh, perpetual. And um, I suppose I, I'm, well, essentially a lazy farmer, but uh the the kind of premise behind that is if 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 things are difficult i've found uh that um it's a real indicator that i'm kind of battling nature and if things are easy then i'm kind of going the right way and uh, so that's kind of a check i use all the time um so uh yeah and uh, obviously want to be profitable but the perpetual thing is the key thing because if the farm if the system or if the way it's been managed is not perpetual, then it's degenerative and I don't want that to be the case. So um, so just a quick outline of what holistic management is. And uh, it's a, an approach to land stewardship that incorporates the complexities of nature. Now, that's a little bit limited as a as a definition of holistic management, but it, it's, a, it's an easy one to anchor onto at the start. Um, and holistic management is made up of financial planning, land planning, um, grazing management, and ecological monitoring. And uh, I'm kind of going to focus more on grazing management today. And um, I think the most important thing about holistic management is that really it empowers farmers to think for themselves again, because often we lean very heavily on advice uh, from whether it be sales reps or agronomists or whatever. And um, it's often out of context. And 
the most exciting thing for me anyway was that holistic management really taught me uh, the kind of tools that I needed to make decisions for myself. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling, actually. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to focus on that narrow definition at the start because it's a really easy in, intro into the thinking and an approach to land steward, uh, stewardship that incorporates complexities in nature. So complexities in nature is a broad uh, thing and, and, and how to understand nature is, is quite a difficult thing as well. Um, but an easy or a route into doing that or re getting our heads around nature, you can never really fully understand nature, but to get a grasp of it is, is to focus on the fundamental ecology. And um, I think it's a brilliant way, it's a brilliant way to kind of examine uh, kind of modern farming traditions and question if they have a positive or negative effect on, on the ecological processes. And if we break down uh, kind of just natural systems into these four processes, good way to get your head around them. Um, and just by way of example tonight, I'm gonna to focus on energy flow uh, and all of these processes are interlinked and they're all kind of the same thing, but uh, just to kind of understand them, breaking them up in this way is really, really um, helpful. And um, so energy flow is essentially photosynthesis and how we manage it. And um, kind of our goal as farmers uh, and land stewards is, um, is really to, to maximize energy flow. And the way we can do that is, is grow as much green leaf and photosynthesize as much as possible. Um, and it's and that's the again it's that word perpetual. The sun's energy is free and perpetual, so it's it's a it's um it's not it, it's not rocket science. Like it really, it's the easiest thing to focus on. And if we can keep checking back to that, it's a it's a really easy start into this kind of thinking. So <clears throat> if we if we these are kind of three little maybe square foot clumps of, of grass or pasture um, through, you know, that, that are th this way through various management decisions. And if we, if we study them and uh, think which, which of these is going to photosynthesize the most sunlight, um, the first one is obviously a mown uh, meadow or a really tightly grazed pasture. And it's going to struggle to put it inside because it's got so little leaf area. Second one is going to do quite well. It's kind of a short rotation leafy grass. Um, the third one will uh, probably do the best in the sense that there's a load of different leaf shapes. Um, there's a load of niches for sun to get captured in there. The, the energy to get transferred down into the soil is carbon and to grow more plants. And um, the third one is everything gone to seed or kind of over rested. And that has some benefits, but from a productivity point of view and from a, a photosynthesis point of view, it actually slows down because the plants in essence stop working. So keeping it in the middle two is ideal and in the third one is the best. But if we go down through this list of questions that I've made up here, um, what will happen if, uh, if each of these pastures are subjected to drought? Well, the first one will obviously go into drought really quick and stop growing. The second one, if the drought persists, will probably do the same. The third one will be quite resilient, and so will the fourth one. Um, if there's a frost, similar similar case, uh, the leafy leafy green stuff uh, in the second one will um, will probably be subjected to frost quite quickly. <clears throat> Whereas the third one will have loads of resilience there because there'll be loads of um, there be loads of different plants that they're a little bit older, they're a little bit hardier, um, they're they can take it a lot of frost, and um, they're they're fully recovered as well, which is, is key. And the third question is, uh, um, how wh which one is going to create soil conditions for heavy rain? And again, the last two will do that um, because they have deeper roots and um, the soil is covered, which is is the key thing. Um, 
the the funny thing is though that most of our modern agricultural practices focus on the first two whether it be uh, perpetually cutting silage or keeping a short rotation of of ryegrass and clover and um <clears throat> it, it's it's a it's an interesting thing to question and why that is the case when the third one is obviously a lot more resilient all around. So that's kind of what I mean about holistic management, kind of just getting you to question uh, kind of modern traditional practices and uh, actually break it down ecologically. Um, so I just want to talk through grass physiology because it's really difficult to explain it. Um, without little pictures. So I did a load of doodles earlier on today. Uh, well, I was frantically getting my slides together. And um, the, the kind of basis of, of grass physiology is that grasses evolved with grazing animals, so that they, that they have no way of defoliating themselves. Um, and being perennial plants, they need to do that to, so that they have room for next year's growth to happen. And um, so they've evolved with grazing animals, grazing animals graze them off and uh, they regrow. But they have a very clever mechanism. So they photosynthesize, obviously they harness the sun's energy, but they also have a kind of, an ability, it's like a capacitor in, in electronics. They can store uh, energy as well. And they store that in their roots. So when they're grazed off, they use that stored energy to regrow. And, I've kind of represented that through this kind of orangey red uh, marking underneath the roots. And um, so in this the second image there, you can see that energy going back up into the plants to regrow it, and it'll grow up into uh, to being fully recovered or having more energy than it did at the end. And the last image there is is just to represent how when a plant goes to seed, it uses some of that root energy, but it's mostly the energy within the plant itself it uses to go to seed. Because plants aren't stupid, they know they need energy to grow again, especially uh, perennial ones. Um, so, yeah, what we're aiming for in our grazing practice and when we're grazing is to get a plant to this fully recovered stage that I've circled. So the opposite of that is, uh, are they the, the potentially um, damaging side to that is called overgrazing. And that's essentially where the plant hasn't fully recovered. Um, it hasn't started to photosynthesize uh, fully and put more energy reserves back at, down into its roots. And when it's starting to grow again, it gets grazed again. And that can seriously stress the plant out, obviously, because it's got very little root reserves left to regrow can often shock it to go into uh, a kind of a premature seeding stage, which is kind of a deficient and weak uh, seeding stage. And, or it can just try and regrow again and diminish its roots and get grazed again. And eventually, if you repeat that process, it'll, it'll die. Um, so obviously avoiding the overgrazing thing, um, if we harness the full recovery of grass, uh, throughout the growing season. So every time it's grazed, we let it recover fully and restore its root reserves. Um, uh, we, we can come into the end or towards the end of the growing season with a huge amount of grass. And I'll explain that a little bit more in, in a minute, but I just want to finish out the physiology of grass because it has another trick in that when it goes into dormancy, it actually, um, it shuts down the release of uh, its root reserve. So if you have um, recovered grass going into dormancy and the plant shuts down, um, that root reserve stays in the ground. So you can graze that plant quite hard. You can graze it down to nothing um, as long as you're not doing too much uh, damage to the surface of the soil. Um, and and as long as you allow it to recover in spring again before you regraze it, you can graze it down to nothing. And it's, an, it's actually quite a, a good thing to do in the sense that you're completely defoliating the plant. So it's gotten very little in its way to grow again. Um, again, you do ideally want to leave some litter there so you're protecting the soil. Um, but I just point this out now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about later, but when that grass is regrowing in spring, it's at another vital point 
where it could be overgrazed. So it's really important when it's using that energy it's stored all over winter to grow its spring growth that you don't hit it too hard uh, until it's actually recovered in spring. Um, <clears throat> just to add to that not overgrazing thing, you in summer, in theory, you can graze quite short uh, as long as you leave time enough to uh, progress to recover again. That, that's not overgrazing as long as you leave recovery period. But um, there is an advantage to leaving uh, leaf material behind throughout the summer. Um, and it's basically that if, if you leave leaf material behind, you leave uh, solar panels behind that can photosynthesize quicker. So it's not fully drawn off as root reserves. It's, it's photosynthesizing at the same time, so it can recover a lot quicker. So <clears throat> there's a couple of other advantages to tall, taller grazing or leaving, leaving a lot of material behind. And that is um, uh, you kind of have a reserve left in the field as well. So if you say left a paddock with one day's grazing left, there's always that reserve there, even if it, even if the whole farm starts uh, going into drought, there's always a reserve there to go around again. Um, uh, parasites are a big one, actually. They they tend to live uh, in the bottom two or three inches. They, the cycle of the parasite um, larvae that, that, that um, is digested by the animal crawls up the, the leaf stem to get digested. But if they, if the grass isn't grazed that low, then they, they often don't get eaten and it kind of breaks the parasite cycle. So it's, it's another, another nice advantage. And um, yeah, a, a, yeah, a key thing obviously as well is to make sure you're striking a balance between what's good for the grass and what's good for the cows so that you're not forcing or forcing cows that need high nutrition feed to eat rougher pasture. So we're always trying to keep in that vegetative stage, um, tall but vegetative. Um, I just want to uh, introduce another idea while, while I'm going here. And it's, an, it's another one of those four ecosystem processes it's called community dynamics. And it's essentially kind of fancy word for diversity, but it it implies um, not only diversity of species, but diversity of ages within them species. And what tends to happen if you are leaving plenty of grass behind is you'll get grasses that maybe weren't grazed and you'll get some grasses that were grazed quite tight. And what that will actually do throughout the season is um, you'll be left with, if you were to pick one grass species, say, um, Yorkshire frog, we've, lo we've loads of that. Um, uh, if the animals go into that field and we leave loads behind, there'll be some of that Yorkshire frog that might go to seed and there'll be some that will have been grazed really tight. And um, so there'll be a whole spectrum of that type of plant and different ages of that type of plant. And that will lead to all sorts of resilience from anything from drought to frost to, to heavy rain. And also uh, there's, it's likely there'll be two uh, mechanisms of reproduction, one being uh, kind of vegetative reproduction and the other being uh, going to seed and um, starting new plants in that way. So um, yes, community dynamics is this kind of, it, it, it just adds resilience uh, because automatically, the more diversity you have, whether it's in ages, profiles of plants, or uh, the, the, the species diversity of plants, um, you're just going to get more resilience against all sorts of different things. Um, so to create this or to achieve this, uh, timing is the key. And uh, timing is everything in holistic management. And that's essentially what it's the primary tool that's used uh, and um, uh, you know, uh, farmers are often itching to use fertilizer. Or farmers convert into or, uh, organic are often um, in this kind of anxious stage of uh, needing to put things on the land. But the the, the key thing uh, is allowing the right amount of time for the plants to grow. And the plants plants will do a lot of the work. Um, so. Uh, this is just a kind of an example top 
and bottom of two different management regimes. And the top one is quite typical and quite typical of what I spoke about with the, um, the, the earlier drawings, um, where uh, the season begins and gr grass growth speeds up. And what instinctually you kind of want to do is to graze out those paddocks and make them kind of neat. And uh, so you, you kind of graze them out, clean them out, maybe even top them afterwards and everything looks neat and you keep on moving. But if you do that, what you'll do is you're actually, your moves tend to be really slow because you're spending a lot of time focused on cleaning out those paddocks. And um, what will happen then is you get a wedge of grass ahead of you. And you get worried about having a load of grass going to seed, so you bale it out and then you have a whole spot to your farm that has been mowed out kind of on top of your required uh, fodder and um, you, you end up with paddocks then that are, are have very little grass on them they're very exposed to drought um, they're also uh, their recovery period will be way different to the grazed paddocks so you could possibly add another two weeks for a mowed paddock to recover properly and um, what tends to happen then is because you've kept your pastures so low and neat all, all summer when you start coming into the autumn and growth slows down you need to keep speeding up your moves because um you just need to get enough grass for your animals and what will happen then is you'll run out of grass very fast because you'll come around too fast and you'll start overgrazing and then as you come into winter you'll run out of grass need to house your animals early and uh, feed that hay made during the, the summertime whereas if you do the opposite uh, and when the grass is growing fast, you actually make your moves really fast. As I mentioned in the community dynamics thing, you, you'll start to leave a load of grass behind. It'll be absolutely chaotic and really messy. And you'll have loads of bits of weeds and all sorts of stuff uh, going on. <clears throat> but it's incredible because it builds up this real thick blanket of, of pasture on the farm. And um, as you come around on it again, you have like maybe a time and a half the grass you had on the first rotation. And if you do it again, you'll have double the grass the next time you come around and you just build up, build up, build up bulk. And then when growth, when growth starts to slow down in the autumn time, you can slow your rotation right down. And it's really interesting because I hadn't really thought this through until I did it in the last, last couple of winters. Um, because your rotation is now slow, it actually recovers again. So if you start, at the start of your rotation in say the end of September and you rotate for 70 days, when you come round again, you'll have the same amount of grass again because you'll have rested it for 70 days at the end of the season. And then you can graze it all again really, really slowly over the winter. Um, so you can prolong your grazing season for ages. And if you uh, manage it uh, or if you estimate how much grass you have and limit the cattle to it or limit a part of the herd to it is what, what we've done for the last two years. We've grazed half the herd out for the whole year with no uh, no saved fodder. So it was just the stockpile they were moving through and we finished animals off it. Um, so it was really, really cool. Uh, so that's really the key to um, autumn grazing, I suppose, is starting now and building up that cover right to get you right into autumn. And there's two kind of things you could do with that, I suppose, uh, if you weren't thinking of grazing all winter, um, you could graze the whole lot out and maybe graze out till the end of December or January and then house, and then you'd have a short housing period, or you could um, house at normal time and time or estimate how much of that stockpile uh, will last and then let your herd out just before that up until you have you're sure you'll have enough spring growth and you could you could use that stockpile in the latter end of winter um but the key thing i suppose is um we have some pretty pictures of my cows in the frost um it was incredible how um how well the ground held up as well, because we had this 
really thick blanket of grass and um the roots underneath just uh, the ground was incredibly stable we didn't virtually no poaching there was a couple of couple of little areas on stormy nights where they'd huddled in under hedges and stuff like that they got a small bit muddy but like 99% of the farm was was spot on. Um, it was brilliant. And it, it, I found that winter grazing is also really cool in that it, it, that's I don't top anymore because I'm always trying to build up this reserve. Um, and that the winter grazing is like the top in rotation. It cleans everything out, graze everything down relatively tight and um, leaving the ground just ready with a bit of litter on it for spring growth. Um, the animals are super healthy all winter as well, which is brilliant. Um, so that's just an idea. Of, it's difficult to see how the, the cover wasn't actually that deep, but there was a lot of feeding in it. It was weird. Um, they they got loads of time out of each paddock, and um, that's kind of it post grazing or mid grazing. Um, so there was plenty of cover left. And the key thing for spring, then I'm nearly finished, is. Um, <clears throat> It is, and I was told this by an old man years ago. Uh, he, you know, when I started farming, it was always the um, the coolest thing to be the first farmer with your cows out. We used to dairy farm, and like if we weren't out by Patrick's Day, we we had failed. <laughs> and <clears throat> um, sure, you can be out on Patrick's Day, but you should be out on on last year's leftover grass rather than the spring grass because um, spring uh, is spring in March is always false. Um, and pretty much there's there's all there's loads of stories in Irish folk folklore about uh, getting getting shafted by by spring weather basically. And uh, uh, is um, is the Irish word for May Day. And um, it was a, a like for thousands of years it was a, it was a, it was a festival and it was um it's kind of it's called a quarter day so like the um the the equinoxes and then um Baltina and Samhain which is Halloween were the other quarters so Samhain was always for, for for livestock management they were both livestock festivals really uh was when you um when you kicked into winter mode and uh Baltina was uh when you started into summer mode basically um and i found and this old farmer told me that whatever you're doing uh, you really should have uh fodder reserves or stockpile grass right through till at least the first of may because this is in the west of ireland um but uh because otherwise <laughs> otherwise you're just fooling yourself um and you'll get cut short but uh as I kind of mentioned in the earlier illustrations, um, it's so important not to overgraze spring growth because if you do, you'll kind of knock back your grass for the whole year, essentially. So keeping your grazing really slow and steady through uh, kind of stockpile grass right up till that spring growth is, is at a recovered stage is, um, is the key. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clive. That was beautiful and so detailed, um, but so clear. Thank you so much. You. And I loved your drawings. Those were gorgeous. And thank you for sharing all these pictures of your farm. Let's have you um, stop sharing your slide deck. We, we can always share it again if there's a picture that you want to show. And I'm looking for questions from folks. And uh, you can do it in either typing it into chat or you can raise your hand as you prefer. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions until we get questions from people. My first question was, you, I think you said that cows actually like Yorkshire fog. And I hear from so many farmers that they don't think cows like Yorkshire fog. So what's that all about? 
Um, well, we, we, <laughs> we don't have any choice, I suppose. Um, I think a lot of it's down to uh, just having adapted animals to the land. Um, the, we, we, the, the land would have been quite dominated by Yorkshire bog. And when we started uh, mob grazing and then moved on to holistic management, it had, they've really diversified. Um, but when we started growing longer covers initially, it was uh, it was it was really obvious how dominant it was in in Yorkshire fog, and um, like we just finished that animals off it and it was fine. I I, I remember mentioning it to somebody. It was actually a groundswell, uh, and I said, "Oh yeah, we've loaded the Yorkshire fog." Quite proud of it. And I didn't know it was a bad thing, <laughs> and like it, it it never never was an issue. But uh, that being said. It's it's it is diminishing in the sense that it's not dominant anymore. It's definitely present in the pastures quite a bit, but um, we we have a huge diversity of grasses now, which is really exciting. That's good. I'm glad to hear your cows like Yorkshire fog. I think it's a great grass. It bulks up so nicely and hmm. gives structure, and uh, it's a great grass. Well, that juiced things up, and so now we're starting to get questions from the studio audience. So um, I might say your name wrong, but Pedraic says, hi, Clive, Pedraic from South Galway. Which animals Por Poric, do you- Porik, Porik. Porik, thank yeah. you. Which animals do you typically try to outwinter? Was going to try my one and a half year olds. Yeah, that's that's what we did. And, but it was, it was, well, I suppose it was two reasons behind it. The finishing animals and our yearlings, uh, were, were what we outwintered and we housed all our cows and calves. And that was, um, it was just an easy divide and the cows were a little bit bigger, I suppose, for a lot of the year. And um, also uh, the, the management of the cows and the calves was, because we calve in May. Um, so we carry the cows on the calves we carry the calves on the cows all winter and we wean them out of the shed in spring to join the outwintering herd. So it just kind of fits uh, the, the model at the moment. And this winter coming, I think i bracing myself just to go for it and I winter the full herd. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> we'll I'm see. looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> we'll oh, see. that's it'll, fantastic. It'll be cool. Okay, yeah. well, I'm going to jump to James Gilmartin's question and then we'll go back to the ones in chat. So, James, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. How are you, Clive? How's it going? Um, How's and, and, and actually, great, fair play, brilliant, illuminating as always, pardon the pun. But um, two questions I've had, I'd say it's probably relevant to a lot of us maybe at the start of this journey, is, and I love the bit about the leisure um, being part of the um, uh, your holistic context, is daily moves, time, how does that work for you? Like, what time, I mean, this is, I know, and it's very broad, fast in the summer and slow in the winter, but how much time do you devote each day? And then um, from a water point of view, I know you have a great setup with the ponds where you are, but like, I suppose it's just a matter of going after it. I suppose well, the time is the first thing. And the secondly is in outwintering. Um, and I know you're building up the, the, the trees on the farm, but like, do you have any kind of a, I don't know, a trailer or anything that you bring along, kind of maybe a shelter that you might bring with them to keep them kind of sheltered? Uh, I know cows are well able to put up with anything we have in Ireland. Um, uh, we, we are running fairly hardy animals as well. Like they're all kind of traditional breeds and stuff. And, we have a Galloway bull at the moment, so they're getting hardier and hardier as we go. Okay. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, definitely um, shelter adds so much and trees and hedges add so much because if they're struggling uh, to maintain kind of body temperature, uh, they're going to eat way more. And the less they eat in winter, the better <laughs> uh, as yeah. far as, you know, for maintenance. Um, so yeah, I, I don't bring anything at the moment. Uh, I've used breeding as my main tool there um as far as time i yeah very little and i've spent an awful lot of time planning um can you see me yes. I, yeah can you we see can that? see you what are it's you showing blurry. us yeah it's, that's our uh, paddock map oh, okay yeah. very hard to 
Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I forgot my camera is blurry. Okay. Yeah, it's but, blurry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we've loads, we've loads of products and they're all laid out, but it's all quite simple because we've kind of, with fairly well fenced fields. And then I put um, marked fence posts uh, at each end of the field where I want to pull a paddock and then we just run a poly wire. Um, and spent a good bit of time just evolving the, the drink in the water. It's all over ground pipes. We just drag pipes uh, and the trough and um, uh, set it up yeah, daily. And we kind of have little clever places to park it that we can get two or three paddocks out of it and stuff like that sometimes. Um, but that's just evolved. And I left it all over ground to allow it to evolve. So. There's two main water sources on the farm, and we just have a kind of um, with one main 100 meter pipe that kind of goes round in a, a whole circle, and then there's a load of other pipes just laid along fence lines that we attach that into, and then that feeds the whole area of the farm and then that, wherever the cows are. So there's very little live at a time, so we we can check for leaks quite easily. Um, otherwise, it's just having a spine of electric wire through the farm that we can operate everything off. But um, I'm fine tuning uh, the paddocks all the time. Um, yeah, to the point of, of nauseam, but uh, <laughs> I won't go into it now, but I've been marking contours last, last week and stuff, but they, that's mostly to put in place agroforestry systems in the future and make sure I'm, I'm making the right decisions there. But um, it's it's a real interesting way actually to set up paddocks in holistic management also just just as a as a point your paddocks remain the same throughout the whole grow, growing season so um you can draw it all out on a map and because you're planning all your rotations daily you can actually plan how long it's going to take you can plan what fences you need to put in um because you have a map in front of you and you have your chart in front of you where your animals are going so um, if there's a difficult uh, bit of a move or, or something is, is posing trouble, you can identify it quite quickly and address it um, and make kind of good decisions for kind of long-term places to put fences and things. So yeah, it's all tied into this management. You should, you should yeah, get trained. Yeah, just go, <laughs> go and do the course, I think is there. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for Answer sure. Answer all your questions. No, no worries. Good on you. All right. Thank you, James. And um, because he mentioned it, I'm going to insert a little advertisement right now before we take the other questions. And that is in June, the 12th to the 14th, uh, in collaboration with Knots or uh, National Organic Training Skill Net and with Clive, uh, we'll be offering holistic management fundamentals. And Clive will be giving us a tour of his farm included in that. Okay, so that's my advertisement. Now let's go to Marge. And Marge says, regarding spring growth, would you start grazing it slow, even though growth might be fast growth? So initially you hold back a bit. And then I'm just going to add a related question, which is, how do you know when it's growing fast? And how do you know when it's growing slowly? What are you, how are you monitoring that? And and then Marge's question: Do you start slow in the yeah. spring? Yeah, it's a it's a tricky moment. But uh, as I the key to it is having having that stockpile, having that reserve, so that you minimize that area area of doubt, I suppose. And um, uh, yeah, so essentially, no, we aim to. Once we're onto proper spring grass, we, we aim to grow go fast. Um, for for kind of two reasons, if growth isn't up to full tilt, um, right into May, it definitely will be soon. Um, if it's not, you're to totally screwed. But it's very unlikely. Um, and if you graze hard, if you graze that early spring growth hard, you'll really knock it back. Um, and if you just take the tops off, it's going to recover so quick. Like you're you're putting everything on, on you're, you're gambling everything on it recovering quickly. So, but 
uh, the gamble is is very small um, because you've because you've held back for so long and it, it like it should be recovered or really close to recovered before you start into it um and this made everything goes bonkers so quickly so you really need to keep on top of it because you you can lose sight in a couple of days and end up with the load going way ahead of you so um but that all being said i the most time I walk my farm is that time of year. Um, I go round and round and round checking which are the good paddocks, which is because I'm I'm making my holistic management plan. Um, I'm, you know, accumulating all that information so I can just make good decisions of where to start grazing. Um, I love places I presume I'm going to start grazing due to what I've done in winter or what I've done last year, but you really need to check and monitor all the time. So um that's not a very clear answer, but you really need to just think a lot uh, and walk around a lot and, and make decisions based on ecological processes. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Well, I think you've really highlighted how important it is to observe. And yeah. Gabe Brown says farming is a thinking person's game. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of observation and thinking going, going into what you're doing. Our next question is from Victoria, and she says, we have wet fields and do keep our cows indoors. We need to make silage and hay for winter forage. What is your advice on mowing to ensure we don't weaken the grass growth too much? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, um, I, I, in the last few years, I've really observed how how damaging mowing can be. Um, at the, just for, as an example, we have a lot of wet fields too, uh, <laughs> and there there are areas of the farm we we don't winter graze in um, at all. We kind of we use them at the end of our summer rotation, um, and kind of you know let let the drier ground recover at, at the end of the last rotation, but. Um, yeah, a silage. Uh, our my contractor mowed a path in one of my grazing fields on the way into mow field that he was going to cut for silage and uh, or hay, and that path got destroyed when I was doing the last grazing, and it was it was phenomenal the difference in soil. Uh, just the structure had completely broken down in the area it was mowed, and like they hadn't left a mark on the bit that they were grazing. Um, how much heart it takes out of the pasture um, is, is amazing. Um, so yeah, I guess if you can convince your contractor not to mow that tight, uh, it, it's a good start, I suppose. And um, kind of try and plan to minimize what mowing you do and rotate that mowing throughout the fields. We're very limited on how much we can rotate. Um, we've kind of had the same meadow for for years and it's absolutely knackered it's re, it's recovering nicely now but it was completely knackered and it like it got everything you know it got lime it got farm manure it got slurry um but the soil structure was completely shagged in it no matter what we threw on it um and it was just all down to mowing because when you're mow uh essential well you have basically pasture that's been over rested um, to allow to build up enough material to mow and then because it's over rested the plant density reduces ever so slightly and then you mow it down to the ground so there's loads of exposed soil there so you end up capping that immediately after uh, after the first rains and so over time uh, a field is continually mowed will end up with very thin plant spacing and um and and it's just through that process it's just through overresting making it really bare taking all the litter away and exposing soil and um another key thing to look at apart from plant growth is just looking down at your feet and seeing what percentage of the ground is bare soil and what's covered in litter and what will happen it's a really nice thought experiment just walking around what will happen when a raindrop falls right down there? Will it, will it will it hit bare soil? Will it hit a plant? Or will it hit um, kind of uh, dead litter on the ground or um, dead dead plant matter? 
And if it's hitting bare soil, it's it's capping the soil. Um, it's like that's just what happens. And if it caps the soil, it it inhibits grass growth. It um, it can if that persists without any disturbance, it can actually uh, start a mini desertification in that tiny area. And then every time rain hits on that, it's washing off sideways rather than infiltrating. So it's it, it, it's so subtle but drastic, and it happens on all farms. Um, and happens in all all livestock farms uh, throughout the country. And the, the tighter you graze your grass, or the more soil you expose throughout the year, the less photosynthesizing that's happening. But the more you're leaving that soil open to cap in, and it's it's detrimental. And the best way to kind of reverse it, I think, is to allow a good recovery and then hit it hard, um, so that you're trampling litter in, and covering that soil. Um, and allowing it to recover again and letting the plants thicken up. Um, sorry, that's a long meander from mowing silage, but yeah, just be careful when you're mowing. <laughs> Victoria, did you have any follow up question? Because I know that was a really big question. Um, it is a very big question, and it's probably about you know the suitability of the farm for livestock in the long run if you have to bring them in because you've got effectively you're in a, a flood valley of a you know it just gets very wet um, and we are doing we have got grazing fields which I can see are doing better but those fields we've taken silage off not looking great mm -hmm. so I'm just trying to think how we can recycle cycle and give the silage fields a rest um, year on year so that we don't do the same fields all the time that yeah. might help totally but um, yeah, I think your your first question or your first point is is a good one. Uh, it, um, uh, thinking that is the farm suitable? It probably is suitable for livestock, but it may not be suitable for silage making. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so the, so, like so yeah, so if you, yeah, so you have to buy either buy in your fodder or um, uh, yeah, move them somewhere else in the winter where they can go on dry ground. <laughs> Yeah, and but it is it is phenomenal if you allow recovery all year, how much you can graze wetter ground in the winter. It really holds up if you have that root, if you have that mass of grass and massive roots underneath. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, silage cutting. You know that if you cut mid season, say, uh, the chances of building up that root mass in that plant matter again in the season are diminished heavily. So it's yeah. always going to be vulnerable coming into the winter. Um, I mean, what are your stocking rates? Uh, um, they're, they're getting lower, uh, but that is, um, that, that's for another reason. Um, I'm, uh, we were well able to maintain a stocking rate of about livestock unit per hectare, which is quite high for this area of the country in organic operation. Um, we've we've we're taking our stocking rate right down because we're planning to uh, do a massive agroforestry planting in the next few years. Um, so uh, once that's all established, we'll 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 ramp it back up again. But um, yeah, okay. I suppose for outwintering, uh, a nice ballpark would be 0.5 a livestock unit per hectare. I think I'd be able to carry that without any difficulty. Okay, we've got lots more questions. So um, thank you for yeah. answering Victoria's question. We've got thank a question you. from Talis. Has the diversity in your sward come naturally? It has, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, ama amazing stuff has happened. Uh, um, and probably really early in my like kind of um, headspace journey, <laughs> uh, like one of the, the the first observations I made was these fields are shagged and look what's growing on the, the roadside verges. And I think there's loads of times uh, the farmers are just envious of what's growing on the road roadsides. And um, this year, for the first time, I've seen cow parsley growing in my pasture, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, the diversity is pretty. We I did a bit of tinkering with um, 
uh, kind of overseed in multi-species wards and things like that. And we have trickery popping up in places. And But um, yeah, pretty much the farm isn't suitable for any kind of uh, heavy tillage. So we never really uh, went, went deep with reseeding or anything like that in the past. So we have a massive old seed bank there and uh, it's expressing itself year on year and in more exciting ways uh, every, every time. So it's cool. Okay. Now Seamus says, thanks Clive, nice presentation. Do you think these principles could work on a continental weanling to beef system or is it much suited for lighter, hardier stock? Um, it, well, it's down to your farm, really, I think. And um, yeah, uh, like the, the principles that everything is based on are ecological principles. So they work pretty much anywhere. It, 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 the way I do it, is 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 not a prescriptive solution for every other farm it's the solution that i've come to for my farm based on very fundamental principles so yes you can do holistic management on every farm um but mimicking exactly what i do on your farm probably it, it may or may not work like we have a lot of limousine genetics in our older stock and like we started mob grazing um over 10 years ago uh just before i converted to organic farming and um like we instantly increased our stocking rate on what it was from when we were conventional and we had limousines and we were finishing limousines no problem um so yeah we were also making loads of silage and you know spending lots of money on on other things but um it uh yeah absolutely it's no no problem Okay, great. Um, we have more questions in chat, but let's take Jack's question. Jack, open up your microphone and share your question, please. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. No, sorry, mate. My camera's not working, but uh, that don't matter anyway. But um, no, it's kind of more of a comment um, than a question. Um, I've been kind of in this space for the last couple of years. I've done, done the course. Uh, and really starting to see changes now this year. Um, I was actually talking to Clive there last week. I rang him, I was a bit concerned. And the thing he said to me was, don't worry about what you're leaving behind. And it's kind of, it was kind of a light bulb moment for me, you know, because uh, I suppose I've been, you know, in the commercial farming space all my life. And, you know, it's kind of holding me back, I suppose. And I need to get that stuff out of my head. And, um, just go for this because like last year was the first time I really tried it uh, and it was a bit of a disaster because when you take away a fertilizer uh, you kind of have nothing for a while you know uh, but this year I rested the land over the winter I kind of brought the cows in early um, gave it a good rest and I actually used some super soil uh, it's a product it's a biostimulant as well last year and I think it's really working now. Grass is really lipping out this year. I have loads of grass um, and things were going well. Uh, so, and I'm a, just for the audience here, I'm a dairy farmer. Uh, I've been dairy farming all my life and, um, you know, really starting to see changes now and very excited about it. Uh, I suppose I still have those little fears. Um, financial pressure is one of them. Um, and that's, you know, everybody telling you that you're doing things wrong but you need to listen to yourself and, and trust trust your gut and and use use all these people this is a new community like and let's use use each other ask questions and you know it's all about getting a bit of confidence in yourself so i'm i'm on a great journey and uh, hopefully we can continue it so that thanks and thanks live for your time last week <laughs> anytime Jack. Thanks for that. That's cool. Sheila disappeared. You're muted, Sheila. Oh, sorry. I just said thank you so much for sharing that, Jack. Yeah. That was really wonderful to hear your story and your encouragement to other people. Um, 
Steven says, thanks, Clive. How do you deal with grass that has gone to seed? Top it, graze it hard, leave it. It has shot up so fast in the last two weeks. Um, yeah, so uh, kind of what Jack was alluding to there, uh, don't worry about what you're leaving behind. Um, keep the pace of the rotations up is what, what, what I would do. Um, and what's left gone to seed, it, will add to that community dynamics. Now, mostly what's probably going to seed now is meadow foxtail, and um, it'll fall over and be fine in a while, and the kind of later season grasses will, will take over. Um, I'd completely ignore them. I keep making sure um, that uh, I was keeping up the pace of the rotation and get in, get in round, because they're going to graze out a good portion of every paddock um, and that will keep that bit vegetative and then you'll have clumps and areas that are gone to seed and those bits will add to your seed bank and um, they'll add to roughage later on in the season as well. So just keep on going around and um, and when that will add to your bulk at the latter end of the year. Wonderful. Um, a similar question, but I know I remember you asking this question a lot during the training. And so I'd be curious to know what you found. In relation to wet ground, how have you managed rushes without topping? Yeah, still a contentious issue. <laughs> um, so I have found in some areas, rushes are kind of dying back and I found in other areas they're getting worse. And my conclusion uh, is, is a broader geological one. <laughs> And I think, um, first of all, get into the root cause, which is the key. Uh, most of the solutions uh, that we take in farming towards rushes don't solve the root cause. Um, I had a really nice, actually, micro experiment this year. And I have a couple of kind of passes that have been designed into the farm. And uh, one is on a really old ancient road and there's a section of it that's really rushy. And um, there's another section adjacent of it that runs up through a rushy field. And we had a farm walk last summer and I, I mulched that down to the ground, like absolutely, like it was like a lawn, just because there was a hundred people walking around the farm and we needed to keep it safe and easy for everyone to navigate. And, um, it was really interesting then. Uh, the bit that I didn't mow uh, grew up to chest high rushes and the bit that I did mow came back in like really vigorous uh, green um, new growth of rushes. So the chest high rushes were all brown and really struggling uh, and actually self mulching themselves. And then during the winter rotation, I kept the whole winter herd in this little laneway for a couple of hours and they absolutely leveled the one that I never mowed because it was it was it, it was gone to the stage where it would lodge and the stuff that we mulched uh, and topped down to the ground had come back with all this vigor and it just stayed up no matter what we put on it and what trampled it just stayed up and was vigorous all, all winter and into the spring and now the one that was trampled on and lodged has really weak spindly rushes coming up through it. And the one that uh, was mowed is like as good as ever, like it's not gone anywhere. So it was a really nice little, little example. And it's very hard to replicate that and make that happen across whole fields. And that bit that lodge will probably come back because <laughs> um, the rushes like it there. And rushes are a real weed of, of um, they, they maintain their environment like loads of weeds like thistles and everything else actually kind of that they, they 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 will they'll produce an environment that that uh, they get succeeded by other plants and they'll like ducks and thistles their taproot uh, breaks up compaction. That's the main reason they're there in the first place. Once the compaction's gone, they go. But rushes actually will culture the environment they want to be in. So uh, you really need to make a decision about how to 
change that environment. And you could do that by perpetually doing what I, I did and build up a whole layer of organic matter and produce a, you know, a functioning uh, aerobic layer above that might grow better plants and deeper roots and start to break up the soil. But I found over years of mob grazing and now holistic management grazing that it 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 doesn't they they annoy me less because the pastures are so high, so I don't see them all year round. <laughs> and um, they, I, I think, over time they may diminish with the deeper rooting of of this plant grazing. But I think the core problem with rushes on my land and the type of land we have, and it's really heavy, is probably the land should be wooded. You know, like it's got the geological makeup of soil that needs needs heavy physical roots busting through it and um, all our soil has an iron pan and no matter how good I grow grass it doesn't seem to get through it um it may in time but uh, I think the fast way to solve that in a in a perpetual way is to plant trees and that's why we're so uh sold on the idea of, of running agroforestry through the whole farm. Um, I think the trees and the physical action of their roots will just break up that iron pan in a way that you'll never do with a, a deep ripper uh, long term. And the, the, the roots will rebuild that soil structure and, and, and fix everything. Um, yeah, that, that's going to be my solution. <laughs> you'll have to find your own. <laughs> Thank you, Clive. And I just want to check, we have a few more questions. Are you okay to stay a yeah. few more minutes? Yeah, okay, sure. good. So Michael says, during the past few years of transitioning to a more holistic way of farming, what are the main differences that you have observed in nature throughout the farm? Do you have more wildlife or yeah. new yeah. plant species? What do you, what do you notice? Yeah, well, I'm noticing, I'm simply noticing a lot more because I'm looking. Uh, so, but, um, so I don't have a baseline because I probably wasn't looking before. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the place is humming all the time. Um, and- uh, Do you have more insects? Yeah, totally. Yeah, like so much. Um, there's spiders all throughout the pastures there's just stuff going on all the time that just i like there's periods of the year where i'm tripping over frogs like it's just oh. really exciting oh, and, that is cool. and it's all quite subtle uh we've nothing hugely exotic or anything um but uh uh yeah it's 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 like lots of hares lots of foxes lots of buzzards lots of frogs <laughs> you know there's lots of just kind of middle of the road stuff going on but it's lo loads of it and the farm is a it's a drumlin landscape so there's there's a quite an exposed hill that runs down to to a turlock on one side uh, which is a, a lake that disappears uh, in the summer and uh, a kind of peaty or soil on on another side and it's i've been using that um merlin app to uh, to identify the bird song um and uh, so you just turn it on and it just it's like an, and tells you what birds are singing around. And it's really interesting um, how different the profile of birds are in different areas of the farm. And, and it's consistent. You know, there's down in the, the, the peatier bottoms is a whole different spectrum of birds that I never hear up, up around the house or, um, or up on top of the hill. So it's, it's really, it's really cool. So there's lots of lovely subtle things happening, I think. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, uh, Seamus has a winter grazing question. Do you have very tight paddocks over the winter to yeah. avoid overwalking and heavy poaching? And is the winter rotation just one rotation until spring growth, or are you going around multiple times? Um, yeah, the paddocks are tiny. Um, so basically, in the summertime, we have uh about 52 paddocks this year um and the winter we have 180 so uh yeah so um we just draw a new map and break the paddocks up and um w when you do when you do a grazing chart for the winter it's actually and you go right i need to get through to at least the first of may 
um, here's the land I have available, here's how much grass I have, and you draw a grid on it, and you put the cows out on one of those parcels. Uh, if, if they eat it all too fast and they're really hungry the next day, then you have too many cows out. <laughs> so you, you, can tell, you can find out very quickly if, if you're going to achieve your goal or not, um, uh, if you plan it properly. Um, but yeah, we for the last two years that I've outwintered fully, uh, I've done a single rotation. Um, uh, I've been tempted to try uh, uh, going around twice lighter, uh, so <clears throat> and I know people who do it and do it successfully. Um, the first year, I was quite nervous that they, they their first grazing would take. Um, the heart out of the, the, the sword and that they damage it the second time round. Um, but I'd be more confident to try going around twice next year, I think, um, seeing how much they, the land had improved this winter. Um, it was phenomenal, actually, how good it was this year. In November, uh, we dug a new pond up, right up on top of our hill and they, they like 13 ton digger, drove up the field um, and he drove up and down actually three times and there's no there's, there was no mark left it was it was phenomenal and he was um he's my cousin and he gives me loads of abuse and and, and is always slagging me and stuff but uh when, when i pointed that out to him or i asked him how many fields have you been in in the last couple of weeks where you could drive through and not leave a mark and he just like he could he had no comeback <laughs> so, so. Yeah, it, it is brilliant, um, and it's in, like it's just incredible how how just having that pasture with heart in it will hold cattle up. It's it's phenomenal. Your story about your cousin might be an answer to our last question. <laughs> um, this one is from Aoife, and she says, great presentation, Clive. I remember using your Farming for Nature video as a teaching tool um, years ago, a couple a year or two ago. And they found it very hard to just imagine doing something like mob grazing. How do you communicate your reasoning and methods to farmers stuck in the conventional mindset? Send them a link to this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's difficult. Yeah, it's really like, like Jack was saying, it's it, like those kind of modern traditions are ingrained in, in, in people. Um, like my generation and the previous generation has just grown up with a, a, a different a different approach where a lot of the advice we took or a lot of you know there was, there was less and less observation and more leaning on on, on agri-industry advice and um i was actually listening to a podcast today about um tillage and uh it was just it was just gave me an um was, yeah we better not slander anyone but uh it was um it was just it was about conventional tillage and their their non-questioning way of of using um fungicides and you know just throwing a different an, an extra bit in the tank uh just to just in case and all this kind of chat and um none of it questioning what's it going to do ecologically, what's going to do to the soil long term, uh, just just about getting that crop for that year. And it, it was just so limited in its in its range. And um, but like that's the culture and it's really difficult to shake people out of it. But I think the key the key approach is is to take it to the simple ecological stuff because that you can't argue with that like it's it's the basis of of all life so um if you can if you can steer the argument or the conversation to that then you can't you can't really lose the debate great thank you so much clive it's been a pleasure to be with you and i can see the sparkle in your eye even through the blurry camera <laughs> You know, we could see your sincerity and um, the integrity of what you're doing. 
And I just really deeply appreciate uh, your sharing what your knowledge and wisdom experience with everyone. And I encourage everyone, please come to the training in June. It's going to be really phenomenal. And we'll be able to spend time with Clive and see his farm. And uh, that's it for tonight. Any final words from you, Clive, before we adjourn? I know. Thanks for listening to me waffling. <laughs> that's what it is. Uh, you did great. You did a super job. Yeah. Cool. All right. Deadly. Cheers. Have a good Thanks evening, everyone. everyone. Yeah, take care. Bye. Thanks very much. No worries. Welcome. Bye. Bye.